I have for you today is metrics driven Ruby Rails performance. Uh, it's a topic I've been getting more interested in uh, around the last two years really and I think it's one of the pieces that we're missing from the community right now. Uh, you know, Ruby has been famous or infamous for having this testing emphasis uh, over the last few years, five, six, seven years, but performance considerations are really kind of the next step beyond testing. Like testing proves that your app works. But that's not really good enough. It has to also work quickly. And I, I think we're growing this consciousness. So let's talk about how to get started with performance metrics. Uh, so as Kobe said, my name is Jeff Kazmer. Jumpstart Lab is my company. Uh, here we got me and Steve. Uh, Steve will be talking to you later today. It's basically Jumpstart Lab Comp in terms of percentage of Jumpstart Lab employees that are speaking here, which is 100. We're taking over. <laughs> we're taking over. <laughs> Watch out, LA. Uh, in March, uh, has anybody heard of Hungry Academy? No? Yes, in the back, okay. So uh, I, I have been uh, contractually absorbed into the Borg known as Living Social, uh, where I'm going to be teaching a group of 24 people who know somewhere between something and zero about programming, and five months later, they're going to join the Living Social engineering team. So it's kind of a grand experiment in long-term, intense developer training. If you're interested in that, we're going to do another run in September, and I can tell you more about it sometime during the day today. But what we're going to talk about is runtime performance. How does your app perform when it's actually in production? Which can be very different than it is in development. You know, one of the key mistakes you see when people are interested in performance is in development, you create some sample data, and you run your stuff, and everything's cool. And then it turns out that in production, having a thousand users is actually a lot slower than having five users or whatever two users you bother to type in. Uh, we, we don't, or I should say, we rarely automate the process of creating a lot of test data. You know, like how many times in your app do you say, all right, this thing works well enough, let me now write a rake task that's going to generate 10,000 objects and see how things feel after that. Getting into and observing runtime performance is a really interesting issue. Uh, what you'll find is that it's your database. That's the problem. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I gotta say a little bit more than that. Uh, Ruby community, Ruby programmers love to throw out this quote, right? Just ignore the first part of it. But optimization, like who cares about performance? If you talk about performance, you're a jerk. Like we're writing Ruby here, we don't care. Uh, the real quote, of course, is that premature optimization and the emphasis on the premature part. But then it raises the question of what is mature? What does that mean? Is there some point, you know, where like the boss says, yes, your software is mature, now it must be fast. <laughs> no, the point that it's mature is when some poor bastard has to use it. Right? When you have your first user, that's when it is mature enough that you need to care about performance. Because uh, you know, this whole Ruby thing started around 
joy. You hear Matt's always talk about joy, and in the early days, you would just see it on like every presentation, somebody was talking about the joy of Ruby programming. The joy of using software is when it does what you want and it does it quickly. If it does what you want and it does it slowly, that is not joy. You will not be happy. If it does it quickly but doesn't do what you want, that will also end very poorly, right? So the mature software is when people actually use it. Only your users care about performance. Developers actually don't give a shit about performance. But they should care about users. The greater your performance, the greater your happiness. You know, uh, Fred Wilson, uh, I think, or it was maybe the Y Combinator people, did an article about uh, observing the performance of applications and how much people enjoy them in the first few minutes of using it. And it, it gets pretty clear that performance draws happiness for the users. When things are responsive, people enjoy using them. The more responsive they are, the more users you're going to gain. And the more users you have, of course, the more money you make. So if you like money, you need to have a performant application. In the end, performance is user experience. And if I did a, you know, one of these hand polls that said, how many of you consider yourself a UX person? I bet 10% of you would. And that's kind of a shame. We need to kind of take the stigma off of UX. You know, it's not social media expert. Like, UX is an actual thing. And you as a developer are probably the most <laughs> critical piece of user experience. You are the one. It's not just something you can put off and say, like, someone else will deal with user experience. Every line of code you write dictates user experience. And so you need to think about yourself as a user experience uh, developer, user experience expert, and decide that it's the only thing that matters. If your users don't like your application, all the beautiful patterns and plugins and uh, test frameworks, etc., that you use really are inconsequential. They were a waste of time, honestly. People don't enjoy using your program. So let's talk about goal setting. When you're big time, you might be like Etsy. Uh, if any of you have seen a talk from the Etsy data people, they do amazing metrics where they can like chart everything and cross all their like here's a deploy and then after that deploy we saw sales increase by half a percent over the next three Mondays. Damn. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's really interesting. Um, they're getting really good at this and you, it makes sense if you think about it. When you're talking about the scale of Etsy, a lot of these things are easier to test when you're at massive scale, right? When you have a million transactions a day, you make a little change and now it becomes a million plus 2,000, that's cool. When you have three transactions a day, it's hard to get that fourth one, right? But Etsy has the advantage of scale where they can really try these ideas out and they can tie every piece of work to uh, results from their customers. And it makes sense. If you think about Etsy or eBay or any kind of online shopping, if you're like me, when a page takes more than half a second to load, I've gone to another tab, right? I'm like, I'm totally gonna come back to that, blah, blah, blah. And then I forget about it or like get frustrated with my 86 tabs, like I ah, just close them all, they can't be that good, and they lost the sale, <laughs> right? And so that's gotta be 1% of the time or 2% of the time, and, and so performance is gonna impact sales. When you get started, 500 milliseconds, this is a, a low bar. Every page on your site, on the server side, if it doesn't respond in 500 milliseconds, it is really slow. Okay, you won't notice this necessarily right away in development because you know you hit refresh and like it's there. It's it, it, when it's local, it's half a second. But in production, uh, it's going to be painful. And so I have the displeasure here in LA of sharing my room with Matt Amanetti, and he says last night, "I wish I could do a better French accent." And he's this bullshit. 100 milliseconds. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. Matt will always take your stuff and he will make it meaner, right? So he says 100 milliseconds on server side because when you're talking about user side, and this is a really good point, if it takes 500 milliseconds on the user side, by the time it's transmitted to the user, they fetch assets, their browser renders it, etc. You're talking about over a second. And over a second doesn't sound like a long time, but it is slow. A user will perceive your application as slow. If you're down around 100 milliseconds, you can get that transfer and rendering and still all together be less than 500. So I, I think I would say 500, if it's over 500, it is a serious problem. If you're hitting 100, like things are pretty much cool. But the big point is that if you're not measuring and not paying attention, you have no idea. There's a perception with performance that you can always fix it later. And that's like true asterisk. Like you can fix it later, 
but you can fix all software later. Like it's not set in stone. It's probably going to be seriously difficult if you wait too long. And so it kind of got me interested in these ideas of performance and how we can track things more. Uh, one of the pieces is New Relic. I, uh, I kind of didn't use New Relic for a few years. I used it, and then I didn't use it, and I went back to it. Oh my god, this is amazing. And I'm not, I don't work for them, I'm not sponsored by them. Uh, but I would say to you that if you have an application that makes money, and you're not using New Relic, I think you're really doing the wrong thing. Uh, because it allows you, basically transparently, to dive through your code and see, oh, database is high load, let's see what methods are hitting that, and just jump through everything in an easy to use web interface. So again, I could give you like my end of slideshow, use New Relic, but I won't, because you're all DIY, you're like, oh, we're totally gonna fix this. Does anybody know who this is? Like Mike Holmes, yeah. So Mike Holmes, it's kind of ironic for a DIY, it's like, because Mike Holmes' whole thing is going into homes where some contractor has gone to do something and they screwed it all up, and then Mike Holmes comes and fixes it. Mike Holmes is probably gonna have to follow behind you and fix your <laughs> DIY stuff. But we're gonna talk about x-rays for code. So. Whenever uh, in software, you, the problem solving process is essentially this, right? Like when you're trying to fix problems, you're trying to fix performance or measure performance, you're talking about these four steps. And unfortunately, we can't do them all today. We're going to talk about locating. Okay, so I could go on for two, literally two days about techniques to fix performance. Uh, but I want to show you how to find performance issues. We're going to look at three different areas, CPU, memory, and database, and start off with CPU. Uh, with Perf Tools RB. Google wrote Perf Tools. It's a C uh, monitor. So it runs alongside executing code and records information about it on a time slice basis. Now, I don't know about you, with, when somebody starts talking about C, I start thinking, like, oh, God, please don't make me write C. <laughs> and thankfully, a mod writes C so you don't have to, right? Uh, that's, why, that's one of the things, this is one of my favorite people in the Ruby community. Uh, if you are, are interested in performance at all and do anything with performance, I guarantee Amon is there. Like, if you look at the commit log, it's probably all Amon. Every tool you look at, even if it's started by someone else, it's all his commit, 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 commit. And he's great at this stuff. So he writes the C so you don't have to, and wrapped perf tools with Ruby. So you can stay in our comfort zone, just speak Ruby, and reap all the benefits of perf tools. So the way it works is that uh, on a, a non-blocking basis, it does a measurement every 10 milliseconds. And it asks which method is being run right now, and what is the stack trace of that method? Who called this method? So it's really answering two interesting questions. Which methods are taking the time, right? Which ones are being run right now? But the often more interesting question of, who called this method? Because when you write Ruby, the, the methods you write probably aren't that CPU ex intensive or expensive. It's that they call a bunch of other methods and those methods are really slow. Or they call the same method two billion times and it slows down. Perf Tools runs as a command line program. I'll show you a little bit uh, how to run it. But it also was wrapped up into a rack middleware. So now you truly have no excuse. You don't even have to go to the terminal to use perf tools. You can install this middleware, you uh, just drop it in your bundler, you make an initializer like that, just boot the middleware, uh, and you can set your default printer. Here I've done PDF output, and I'll show you some of the different outputs in just a second. <coughs> and normally, as I develop my app, there is nothing different. Okay? I'm at a normal URL here, normal index action for articles and I get my page. But if on that URL I add profile true, and in this case I overrode the default printer to give me a text output, instead of seeing your page, you will see the performance data from perf tools. So in this case, it's uh, finding that 33% of the execution time is in the garbage collector. 20% in active record, so on and so forth. When you read those lines, it's tricky. Uh, the tool written by Google, it's one of those great like, for engineers, by engineers tools. It outputs a table, and the table doesn't even have headers on it. 
It's like, here's some numbers, enjoy. <laughs> Go read a man page or something and it'll tell you what all this junk means. <laughs> On the left side, you have the number of times that when Perf Tools did its measurements, it was in this method. Don't care. The sample count as a percentage of all the samples it took. Usually also don't care. Where it starts to get interesting is here on the right side, and this is the one that I always look at most. The percentage of samples in this method and methods it calls. So what is the kind of total responsibility of this method? Not just its CPU cycles, but all its callees <coughs> CPU cycles. 8%, that's not a big deal. There's also this great PDF uh, output, and I love the, the PDF is just so much richer. It draws you these amazingly complex graphs like this. And it looks really fancy, like you could put it play now on your wall and be like, yeah, right, booby, what's up? <laughs> uh, and if you use it with Rails in that rack middleware, you'd be like, oh my god, there's like 80 billion middlewares. Yes, this is true. There are that many middlewares, and they all call each other, and it's like a middleware party. <laughs> when you look at those nodes, this is what you'll see. Up top are the calling methods. How many methods called this one, 88 and 89? How many uh, of the samples where actually this method was running itself. Methods it calls come out, continuing the chain, but then the most interesting one is this one. That's the number I'm always looking at. Okay. Uh, the PDF output will also scale the box by this number. So the method that actually does all the expensive computation will show up giant on your thing. Usually that's a SQL, SQL related task or like SQL light if you're in development or whatever. Um, but this is the one I'm always looking at. Who is responsible for all these method calls? To show you the full chart, uh, this is of a Rails uh, request. Uh, not too complicated app, like a little sample app. I don't know if you saw at the beginning, uh, I have a URL that has a sample app and you can try out all these things and has the uh, slides and everything. I'll show you again at the end. But if you run this on a single request, this is what the call chain looks like. Okay. So it, it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, but it is interesting, and if you dig through there, uh, you can find things. So I'm going to show you an example in just a second. The text mode is great for finding methods that themselves are expensive, but I find the PDF mode much easier to sh show those call sh stacks. And to find, okay, this method is taking up a lot of time, why am I even calling that method? Let me walk back up the PDF and figure out who's calling this, and who called that, and who called that. To show you here from this sample project, uh, this is a simple blog system. Uh, it is a continuation of what we built in the workshop. It's called JS Blogger. I set up a sample uh, 1,000 articles, and then there's this front page dashboard. And what the dashboard does is display five most recent articles, five most recent comments, and then a few statistics. And I wrote it intentionally, or Steve and I collaborated on it, and we wrote it to be intentionally inefficient. Right? I wanted to run these metrics against it and show you how jacked up it was. What was really interesting is I accidentally proved the point I, that I completely did not mean to because we wrote about six methods that we meant to be inefficient and it turned out that five of them really weren't that bad. Like we, I, I was like, surely, uh, one of them for instance was word count where it queries all the articles from the database, calls split on them, and then counts the words and adds them all together. A thousand articles, right? Like surely this is gonna take 10 seconds. It actually takes like a quarter second. It was, it was actually not that bad. But it still was slow. When I ran it, the dashboard took almost two and a half seconds, which is ridiculous. I mean, this is a setup, but I want to see would these techniques actually reveal the problem. So two and a half seconds. We run the text output, and I see the top two are SQLite and garbage collection. So what this tells me is right away, because I've done this a few times, we're probably kicking off a lot of queries, not just big queries, but many, of, many small queries, and we're generating a bunch of objects and then we're throwing them away. Right? You'll see this really commonly when you start doing this, that for one reason or another, you're kicking off 100 queries, you're extracting some little piece of data from all of them, or you're counting them, or something really simplistic, and then you're throwing away, like, sorry, tens of thousands of objects, see ya. <laughs> Go ahead, garbage collection. <laughs> when you look at the chart, what I start looking in here uh, is for what did I write? What's the first thing I wrote? Let me come down the stack trace here, or the call, the call trace, uh, looking for something I did. And so I read through there, and I see this one. And obviously you can read that number. <coughs> it looks like this. This most popular method. I implemented this in the article 
class to find which article is the most popular in the system, which one has the most comments. I, I, I did it really to set up a uh, counter cache to say like, oh, you should use counter cache, it'd be great. This single method, regardless of that word count stuff and all that, this method was consuming 60% of the runtime. 60% in one method? Oh my, oh my god, I didn't know it was gonna be that bad. So I've located what is a potential issue. Let me then, the first step I like to take is don't try and fix it. Just prove that you've located the right thing. So I'll stub it out. I'll do like, what is the simplest possible thing that could happen here? So instead of uh, calculating what is the most popular article, let me just do an article.first. Just grab some article. In the ideal case, I would presume that I can get this down to one simple query, and article.first is similar to that. So let me stub it out and see what happens. And it drops the time from 2300 milliseconds to 690. I mean, that's still unacceptable, but that's a dramatic change. There's a 70% drop in, in one thing. So now you say, all right, now you have to go in and fix it. Well, what's the cheater way to fix it? Don't fix it. Just put in a background job and run it asynchronously every minute. And then you don't even have to do anything. Like, you're assuming you got Redis and Rescue already, or if you know you should, boom, now you're done, then you can go take the rest of the day off. <laughs> or you can go in and figure out why is that method so expensive. So I want to do a little bit more digging into that method. Running perf tools uh, from the console. You can give perf tools a block. You say CPU profiler start. Uh, it needs a temporary file to output its data to. Pass it a block and run whatever you want in there and it will track the data just of that method. So I can get rid of all the rack middlewares and all the rail stuff. I want to just focus on this method itself. Then from the terminal, uh, you run these processors to either output it as text or output it as PDF and pop it open in preview. Uh, and then what I found kind of confirmed these suspicions that just that method itself, 62% is spent in the database. Or when you look at the PDF version, it's just like SQLite takes over the whole thing. <laughs> and then when you look at the implementation of it, it's like, oh yeah, this is kicking off, I think it was a thousand times something queries, like many billions of queries, and then you can just fix it. Okay. But you found it accurately, then you can fix it. So that's CPU, and that's really my favorite part, that's the one I use most commonly. Uh, with memory and database, I'm gonna show you some options, but those, that perf tools RB, if you take one thing away, it's perf tools RB, perf tools RB is awesome, and you should try it, and it won't scare you, because it's just a wrap. Middle one. Mempref, 187, Joe D'Amato, uh, is the other Ruby performance person at least two years ago. And Joe and Amon used to be roommates, which just struck me as like the nerdiest Ruby apartment ever. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, Joe is one of these people that got kind of fed up with the Ruby community and quit. And so Memprof, this library that he wrote that was really awesome, hasn't, uh, has been kind of left behind. Amon has the last commit on here uh, from almost a year ago. It's only 187 compatible. So if you're on 187, I really suggest you check out Memprof, but I'm trying to move beyond 187. It's time, we need to let it go. And so I didn't want to recommend this to you because it's not 192 compatible. What is 192 compatible is still perf tools. And you can use it uh, to track object creation. All you have to do if you follow that first piece and you have this middleware already loaded is you add mode objects to your URL. And now instead of tracking CPU performance, it's gonna track object allocation. You can get some output like this, and it'll show you how, who's allocating objects and how many objects they allocate. Personally, I don't find this that uh, useful or actionable, where there's usually interesting things like, oh yeah, I'm allocating 20 billion objects over here. Okay, but then the next step isn't as clear to me. With the CPU profiling, it's clear, like I need to go fix this, I need to change the algorithm, I need to do it asynchronously, whatever. With the memory stuff, it's not always as clear, but can give you areas uh, of investigation. Let me look at this loop and see, uh, you know, I'm, I'm creating a thousand hashes and they're all using string keys, and there's five keys per hash that's creating 5,000 strings and throwing them away. You know, could I just use symbols, and then I would create five symbols in memory instead of creating 5,000 strings, it's gonna save you a lot of objects. There are some other options if you want to dig more into memory. Uh, bringing Matt back again, this is not just like my Matt shout out session, but uh, Matt wrote a little middleware that's neat uh, that tracks the garbage collector. And so every request you can see like, oh, the, it's been 
five requests since the garbage collector ran. Or more likely, if you're running Rails app, the garbage collector ran three times during that request. And if you're not familiar with Ruby's memory model, I should mention about the garbage collector, uh, MRI implements this simplistic garbage collection, right? Where when it is time to collect garbage, all execution stops, and the garbage collector walks through the objects one by one and says, does anyone reference you? Yeah, okay, stay. Anybody reference you? No, out. Anybody reference you? No, out. And if I went through all 180 of you right now, that would take forever, right? And it takes forever in your runtime. So every time the garbage collection runs, your whole system stops until it walks through every object. And this is a big problem. That's, that's why Ruby performance can often be slow. If you don't like it, go manage your own memory, write C++, etc. Uh, you can, in 193, this is something I'm just getting started with, you can manipulate the garbage collector itself. Uh, so you can talk to the, the GC module and ask it, and, and that's actually how Matt's middleware works, is it asks GC, like GC.count, and it'll tell you how many times the, the garbage collector has run in this session since the service started. And then you can obviously do math on that and figure out like, oh, average per request, the GC is running 0.7 times per request, or whatever you like. Uh, you can also dig into the profiler and it'll tell you a little bit more about, oh, I, cre I cleaned up 10,000 strings, I created 18,000 strings, and then you can start to dig into where all those strings and integers and so forth come from. Third and final piece is database abuse. Uh, the one probably that we're most guilty of. One of my favorite little tools for this is Bullet. Uh, it's cute, especially compared to Perf Tools. Perf Tools is so scientific, and Bullet's more like this little friend on your shoulder. You install the Bullet, and you set up an initializer like this. It has more options than this, but uh, those are the ones I started with. And what it does is when you, ref when you uh, kick off a page that has an N plus one query. So what, when this happens <coughs> is most typically you have object A, it has children B, and those B have children C. Okay, and in one page, you're trying to display A, B, and C. So in this case, uh, I had articles, comments, and tags. And when I load the page, it's gonna kick off a query for all the articles, a query for all the comments, and then one query per tag. And so as tags increase, of course, query count goes up, performance goes down. What Bullet does is it watches for you when you get these n plus one queries, when you're kicking off many, many small queries. The problem is probably not that you're kicking off one huge query, it's that you're kicking off a thousand small ones. And so Bullet watches this for you in the background, and what I like is that it interrupts you and throws up a JavaScript alert. This JavaScript alert is completely unreadable. Um, I don't know if you, like, you can't format JavaScript alerts at all in any, in any meaningful way. So they just put a bunch of junk in here, and what it basically says to me is go look at the log. And when you look at the log, what you do is it'll drop this right into your normal uh, server output. It'll say it detected a problem. It'll give you a recommendation of how to fix it. And it'll tell you exactly where the queries were happening. And so when I looked at this in the sample app, I said, oh, okay, there's an issue here with this method. Uh, this recommendation is not always right. When you, when you start using include, now you've shifted the burden from instead of a thousand super tiny fast queries, I'm going to now run like 10 really slow queries. And so it, there's no uh, kind of clear global metric between which one's better. It depends on your data and, and whether it's a hundred or a thousand and how big the objects are. So don't just follow these recommendations and say like, everything is cool now, I only have five queries. Well, each query takes hundred milliseconds, your performance is still going to suck. But it tells you an interesting area to investigate. And when I looked into this helper, what I found was this. Does anybody spot the problem with this? You can shout it out if you do. Like, like, length, right? So a really easy mistake that when you're talking about arrays, length, size, and count are all the same, but when you're talking about active record objects, that's not true. What length does is query the database, fetch the objects, convert them into Ruby objects, and then count them. If you flip this over to count, what it would do is run a count star against the database, which is like, incredibly more efficient, right? The database just returns an integer, and then you get that integer. And by flipping from length uh, to count, just get a cheap 10% improvement. So the tool helped me, it, it gave me a suggestion that actually wasn't right, 
but it told me, here's a place you need to investigate. And then once I knew there was an issue there, uh, with just a little bit of experience, it was easy to read and figure out, oh, yeah, I just need to flip this over, and you get a free 10%. I wish all performance improvements would be those 70% jumps, you know, and then I would literally take like the rest of the week off. It's like, I have done my job, enjoy all your money. Uh, most of the time, <laughs> they're gonna be these 10% improvements, 12%, 8%, and that's cool. That's worth the effort, you know, because installing the tool and running this and fixing it took me eight minutes, maybe. Slow Jam uh, is written by uh, another friend at Living Social. Uh, it watches for slow queries. So you install the Jam, you set a threshold, and what it does is just watch your log file, and it watches this number, and when it crosses your threshold, it gives you this output. Uh, it's not quite as good as having an explain, a, a SQL explain to tell you why the query ran slow, but the thing I really like about it is it, it doesn't just show you the query here, it tells you who ran the query. And if I know who ran the query and I know that the query's slow, I can generally figure out what's wrong with it, that I'm missing an index or it's just doing too much, it's joining a bunch of tables, etc. In Rails 3.2, uh, some of this is built in with auto-explain, and so I was kind of psyched up a few days ago, I was playing with this, and uh, I was going to show it to you all, and it turns out that it doesn't really work. Uh, it's, it's a little bit edge. I'm not sure if any of you have ever observed this, but features that come out in uh, releases of Rails, they sometimes need a point release or two to actually work. Uh, and so this one is that case. If you go on 3.2 uh, stable uh, git, it's, it works fine, but if you have the 3.2.1 gem, it, it doesn't work. At least it didn't work for me. It worked in some cases. When I had 10 articles, everything was fine. And then when I had 1,000, I would start getting uh, called empty on nil. I don't know. Dig through it with the debugger if you enjoy that kind of thing. But that's coming. And I think uh, all Rails 3.2 apps will, if you generate a new app, it'll actually have this in the config by default. Um, if you don't have it in your environment config, it's set to nil, which means just don't do it but you can add it to as soon as you start using 3.2. The big takeaway from all this stuff is there's a divide between guessing and knowing. The first mistake is to not care about performance. The second mistake is to assume that you know what is performant and what isn't. And if you don't measure, you don't know. Right? So don't guess, know. And that's it. If you want to go uh, check out slides and the tools and the sample project and you can mimic all the experiments I did, uh, go here at jumpstartlab.com slash performance. My company is Jumpstart Lab. We teach the best Ruby and Rails training on Earth. And if your company would like to step up your skills, let me know. Thanks.